Hey guys, I'm Philip Molina and Game of Thrones Season 8 is finally here almost. The first episode airs this Sunday, but if you have not had the time to rewatch the last seven seasons, maybe because you were too busy rewatching all of the Marvel movies ahead of Endgame and you can't do both because your children miss you, Alan, then you might be feeling a little lost right now. Hopefully you've checked out our video series and podcast, Westeros Weekly, which digs deep into these questions you have about Game of Thrones. Please subscribe to that on iTunes to keep up with all of our Game of Thrones coverage and get it way earlier earlier than it comes out on YouTube. Okay, so now let's help you sort out all the characters, prophecies, crazy fan theories that you need to know about for this final season. First up, what happened? Quick reminder, season seven left off with all the major players gearing up for war with the White Walkers. Daenerys, Jon, Tyrion, and their crew, they all meet up with Cersei, Jaime, and Euron Greyjoy at King's Landing, forming a very delicate alliance. It's a lot like us in Emergency Awesome. We're not gonna fight to the death, yet. So then Team Danny heads back to Winterfell to prepare their forces for the incoming attack. But no, 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 it turns out Cersei is not planning to actually help wipe out the White Walkers. She lies! She sent Euron to retrieve the Golden Company from Essos so they can kill whichever of Cersei's enemies are left standing after the King of the Night does his damage. And if you're not impressed by the Golden Company, remember these two words, murder elephants. Yeah, they got those. Okay, so Jamie's all disgusted and leaves his sister's side to head north, choosing the good er, guys over his sister and mother of his unborn, as of yet unmurdered, maybe unexistent child? Because remember, she lies. All right, over in Winterfell, Sansa, Arya, and Bran are all together. Samuel Tarly arrives and gets the latest goss from Bran about Jon Snow's true heritage. As both these guys now know, Jon Snow is not the bastard son of Eddard Stark. His real name is actually Aegon, his face, Targaryen, the legitimate son of Rhaegar Targaryen and Ned's sister, Lyanna Stark. He's a Stargarian, if you will. What's that, you don't You don't want to do that? Fine, he's, he's a Targark. You like that? That's what you get now, Targark. To Together they realize John is probably the direct heir to the Iron Throne, just in time for John and his Aunt Daenerys to put their mouths on each other and hug a lot. You know, sex. Of course there's the fact that Bran does know everything and could just warg in and tell them to quit with all that grossness, but he's probably still traumatized from the last time he peeped on some incesty freak on and you know, he doesn't need another trip down memory tower. Okay, and on top of all that, Theon, you remember him? The Ironborn without the Iron Horn? Used to go by Reek, now he sits to take a leak. You remember. He's on a quest to save his sister from his uncle Euron, aka foe Russell Crowe. Also, there is uh, Melisandre. She's the Red Witch whose necklace has the power of Botox. She may or may not return to Westeros to die. She's alluded to that before. And oh yeah, the White Walkers and Night King who just tore through Eastwatch and the Wall with the help of their very own Puff the Ratchet Dragon, and it looks like they're heading for Winterfell next. So that's where the major players are at the end of season seven, but what are the big questions and theories to keep in mind heading into season eight? Now, sure, it's very easy to forget some of this because, you know, the end of the world is coming and there's a bunch of battles between humans and White Walkers, but reminder, this show is called Game of Thrones. So once all those battles are done, who's gonna take the Iron Throne? While Sir Cersei does currently sit on it, if she's somehow defeated and overthrown, or maybe she gets a bad case of Arya throat, she doesn't have any surviving children to take over. So while others may seek the claim, there would be a lot of legitimacy to the previous ruling houses, and not just the Targaryens, technically the Baratheons too. And now with Gendry back and bastards becoming kings in the North, then he might actually have a chance. But of course, the much bigger claim is probably between Jon and Danny. and you thought finding out you're related is the biggest strain you could put on a romance. Now they both have claim to the pointy chair. If season eight doesn't have a lot of scenes taking place in the office of a Westerosi couples counselor, I'm gonna be very worried about these two. Now another question to keep in your noggin is who's going to be the real final threat to our unlucky Starks? Is it Cersei or the Night King? Like yes, the Night King has his very own dead-eyed white dragon, but Game of Thrones has always been more focused on interpersonal conflicts than an unstoppable army of snow zombies. Which by the way is why we will never win in a war with Alaska. It actually wouldn't be that crazy if the Night King goes down in the first half of the season, and then we're left with what George R. R. Martin says is his favorite part of the story, the struggle for the Iron Throne. But yeah, speaking of the Night King, he's got his own questions swirling around his spiky dome. For instance, who is he really? There's a popular fan theory that Bran Stark is the Night King, having 
time-warged into the very first White Walker created by the Children of the Forest. You can actually check out Eric's video for more evidence on that theory. But aside from who he is, we also still don't really know what he wants. What is motivating his war on humanity? Is he out to kill someone in particular? Maybe take out some Children of a Forest? Who knows? Maybe he's just like me and he wants the world to be a winter wonderland of forever Christmas. That'd be delightful. We don't know. By the way, in the most recent episode of Westeros Weekly, we go into a bunch of guesses about what could be motivating this guy, if that is there's any motivation at all, and he's not just some sort of agent of chaos like the Joker was in The Dark Knight. Though he definitely looks more like he'd be in a band with Jared Leto's Joker. Dude, that would be so sick. Frozen Clown Posse. They killed at Warg Tour. Literally. And then reanimated everybody? I don't know, music. Next question. Is Bran done getting stronger, or is he at the beginning of his three-eyed raven puberty? Last we heard, we know he has the power to inhabit the mind of someone in the past and make them into a human Pokemon. Hold on, hold on. But we also know he can be heard by people in the past, like young uh -huh. Eddard Stark at the Tower of Joy. That's something he still might do more of, like in the theory that he was the one that sometime in the past was whispering those sweet, sweet nothings into the Mad King's ear and actually made him said Mad King. That's why you gotta be careful as Shorty's whispering in your ear. Things get hot real fast. Just look at Ned Stark's dad and brother. It certainly fired them up. But yeah, Bran might even have more stuff we haven't seen him do yet. He was once told that he would never walk again, but he would fly. Sure, he's like warged into some birds, but come on. We definitely gotta see at least some hovering through the air a few feet off the ground, at least high enough so his legs aren't like bumping into stuff. Another question when it comes to killing the White Walkers is the prophecy of Azor Ahai, also known as the prince that was promised. As legend has it, the last time the world dealt with the Long Night, it was Azor Ahai who liberated humanity. And same legend has it that he'll be resurrected to save the world once more, like some badass spring-loving Jesus. Wait, isn't one of these episodes supposed to come out on Easter? I think I just figured out how to get my grandma to start talking to me again. Anyway, supposedly this promised warrior will also wield a powerful blade called Lightbringer that has the power to bring light right into your jugular. Now, the biggest mystery about this is that it's likely that whomever's gonna take on this mantle of Azor Ahai is probably someone we already know. So Vegas odds are certainly pointing to Jon Snow, but it could be almost anyone. We even have a video saying how it could be Jamie Lannister. Check that out on your next extra long bathroom break. Also, reminder, even Stannis Baratheon thought he might be the prince that was promised, but yeah, no. Killing your daughter doesn't tend to go hand in hand with being the hero that will save us all. Ironically though, killing a loved one actually is part of the prophecy. It's claimed that Azor Ahai's weapon of Lightbringer needs to be forged with a loving wife's heart. In the past, Azor Ahai needed to kill his wife, Nissa Nissa, in order for his sword to bring the light and bring the fight. So if that part of the prophecy needs to happen, that would mean our hero has to kill their lover. So either John has to kill Danny, or Jamie has to kill Cersei. Or, because the prophecy is actually gender neutral, very progressive, the murders can happen in the other direction too. Okay, another prophecy to keep in your head is about Cersei. Back when Cersei was a little jerk, she went to visit some lady in the woods named Maggie the Frog, who, like Chance the Rapper, has really dope collaborations with the future. Some of her predictions for Cersei were very sweet, like she would marry a king, which came true, but then she also predicted that, you know, all her children would die young. So, the questions to keep in mind about this prophecy, one, it didn't cover what would happen with this potential fourth child that Cersei claims she's pregnant with, so what's gonna happen there, and two, the books contain a final part of the prophecy not seen on the show, where Little Miss the Frog claims that Cersei will be killed by the Valonqar, which translates to Little Brother in Valyrian. Though, she didn't say your Valonqar, just the Valonqar, a Valonqar. So it could apply to Jaime, or Tyrion, or anyone who is a younger brother, technically. Either way, it sounds like Cersei will probably be going down one last time at the hands of a brother. Now, the real question is how many people she and her murder elephants will take down along the way. Okay, and the last major question you gotta keep in mind when you're watching, what's gonna happen with Arya's hit list? As she's evolved into a face-swapping assassin, though not technically an official faceless man, she's managed to cross quite a few names off her old hit list. Some significant remaining names include Cersei Lannister and both both Clegane brothers. If we're to believe the frog, then Cersei's fate seems already sealed, but Arya might have a shot at revenge against either of the Cleganes. Though, it's kind of up for debate whether or not Sandor, the hound Clegane, is still really on her list since she did have the chance to kill him once before and instead she just left him there. And personally, I'd rather see the Cleganes deal with each other themselves by finally giving us the long-hyped 
Plagane Bowl. Gregor versus Sandor. Mountain versus Hound. Head Popper versus Chicken Eater. One of those is more badass than the other, but still, fingers crossed we finally see this happen. Now, looking forward to season eight, just in case you're dead on the inside and somehow you are not hyped enough, here's what you can be pumped for. One of the biggest moments we're looking forward to this season is the Battle of Winterfell, which will probably go down in season eight, episode three, and is set to be the biggest action sequence of the entire series. In an interview with Entertainment Weekly, co-executive producer Brian Cogman said, this final face-off between the Army of the Dead and the Army of the Living is completely unprecedented and relentless and a mixture of genres even within the battle. I'm hoping that includes like slapstick comedy in there or something, but either way, it sounds epic. This also backs up the idea that I had earlier that the threat of the White Walkers could be dealt with as early as the third episode. Granted, there's a lot that would go into this, like whether the good guys figure out how to make enough filler and steel weapons to go around, or that Prince that was promised prophecy has to go really fast and happen in the first three episodes of the season. Oh, but are you saying that that's not hype enough? Okay, how about the fact that the Night King might bring back previously dead characters? They already got a zombie dragon, zombie giants, a horde of undead soldiers, but there's nothing like sprinkling in the psychological warfare of having to re-kill your loved ones. A big example of this could be Lady Stoneheart, the reincarnated Catelyn Stark from the books. She was left out of the show so far, but in the books, Lady Stoneheart is just consumed by rage, seeking vengeance against those responsible for the death of her and Rob. That would be insane. But even if it doesn't happen, how about all the other Starks that are buried below Winterfell? They've got that whole Tomb of the Undead Soldiers just waiting to come into play. Wait, that's not hype enough for you either? Maybe you're a little less into epic zombie battles and more into catty interpersonal drama between ex-best friends? Well, get ready for a bunch of that, like when Samuel Tarly reunites with his friend, Jon Snow, who's actually a Targaryen, who is hooking up with an auntie Targaryen who just burned his father and brother alive. Ooh, indirect aggression. Or how about when you're on a redemption arc and you feel like maybe you are a pretty good guy and then you reunite with that kid that you crippled who, oh, by the way, has since become an all-knowing God-level being. Drama. <laughs> okay, guys, you're all caught up on everything you need to know going into season eight. But if there are any other questions you have about the season, feel free to hit me up in the comments or on Instagram at Philip Molina or Twitter at FEMO. And again, check out our Westeros Weekly podcast feed where all of our comprehensive Game of Thrones coverage, the breakdowns, everything, they'll all be available before they come out on YouTube. Oh, also, if you're going to tweet your questions, make sure to use that hashtag Westeros Weekly and we might answer it on our Q&A show. Finally, do not forget to enter our death pool on guessthethrone.com. Look up the Westeros Weekly group there and then mark down who you think is going to die. We'll be giving shout outs on the Q&A show to the people whose brackets are doing the best and the winner's gonna get a little prize. All right guys, I need to go repent for a lot of terrible things I just said in this video. Peace.